This episode is brought to you by LMNT. Healthy hydration isn't just about drinking water, it's about water plus electrolytes. It makes sense, you lose both water and sodium when you sweat. Both need to be replaced to prevent muscle cramps, headaches and energy dips. But most people only replace the water. Why? Well, because since the 1940s we've been told to drink 8 glasses of water per day, thirsty or not. Drinking beyond thirst is a bad idea. It dilutes blood electrolyte levels, especially sodium, which leads to headaches, low energy, cramps, confusion, or even worse. This low sodium situation called hyponatremia is very common amongst endurance athletes, shift workers, and those who work outside in the heat, leading to thermal stress. The solution isn't to stop drinking water, it's to drink water plus electrolytes. This is where LMNT comes in. Just mix this flavor, electrolyte drink mix into your water bottle and you're good to go. It's got no sugar or artificial junk, just electrolytes. LMNT has your electrolyte needs covered. Former research biochemist Rob Wolf and Keto Gains founder Tyler Cartwright and Louis Villasener formulated LMNT to provide the optimal ratios of sodium, potassium and magnesium for health, performance and energy. They also formulated LMNT to please your palate. Many different flavors such as orange salt, citrus salt, watermelon salt and many many more. Just head over to LMNT to find out. Or better still, go down to the show notes, click on the link, the sleep for performance link, to get um, to click on this and get your free promotional pack where you can get a taster pack and no questions asked refund policy as well. You don't even need to send it back. So check it out at LMNT in the show notes. Welcome back to the Sleep for Performance podcast. Today I am joined by Professor Theresa Jones. Theresa, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Is is it pronounced Theresa? There was a little sort of a a little line over one of the E's that we call in the Irish language of father. You have it spelled. Father, I know, yeah. It's a good song about that one, hey? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's Teresa, actually. Teresa. So my mum my mom put the little line there to make it an A sound of the E, but absolutely no one knows. The only time it's ever been pronounced correctly is when I lived in Brazil. And then it was Teresa, but they couldn't do Jones. So I was Teresa Jonas. So, ah. so I, was going, I was going to ask you, is was that because when I looked at it first, I thought, oh, is there a Spanish sort of Portuguese influence there? It's from, yeah, no, my, my mum just liked Teresa rather than Teresa. So she... She tried to make people's lives easier by putting the acute accent. But, um, yeah. Okay, so she's not. She doesn't have any Portuguese heritage. Not. Like I think that, there's no? some Spanish heritage in Spanish, there. Spanish, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then Jones is obviously a Welsh name, so that's a nice. Jones mix. is my dad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he's from Wales. First language Welsh, actually. So yeah. Did you so speak? Wel- did you speak Welsh growing up? No, he didn't. He didn't um, teach us, unfortunately. So my granny used to kind of talk to us, and then you get halfway through the sentence and think, "Hang on, I've I've only got half for that," and realise that she just puts Welsh words into English sentences and <laughs> yeah so I, I learned a few but um, get out I learned because of the dogs <laughs> so I don't know that yeah, I, I, the only, I even just going through Wales sometimes on the train, you see the words at the train station, you're like, that's just a language I can't even grapple with. I'd rather think I'd rather learn, learn Russian or Chinese, like Mandarin or something, okay. as opposed to grapple with Welsh. I can do, I can do the L's, but um, yeah, no, I can't speak it, unfortunately. Looks quite complex. There's some, some train station went, went through on the way from Hollyhead to Warrington, and I had like about 30 letters in the... Oh, it's the longest train station in the world. It's yeah. Landed, yeah, yeah. I, I was... Really yeah, I thought it was a joke that people were winding me up before we got there. And I was like, no, and then I saw it. I was like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Teresa, this this podcast should be called Diversions or Tangents because yeah, yeah, I always go on. I'm happy to do that. My students will all tell you that I meander. I eventually come back and sometimes I don't. Everything, so, every, everything's related. Everything so, leads to Rome. So, so Ter- Teresa, tell us about where you where you grew up and how you got into this weird, wonderful world of uh, chronobiology and zoology. So I'm, I'm from the UK originally, so I'm from Bristol. I'm in a quite a small town outside Bristol, um, but I went to university in London. And from there, I kind of, I've always wanted to travel. So I, I traveled a lot during, um, after my undergrad, I, I went to a rainforest in Guyana where I sort of lived for three months in a hammock and studied some <laughs> of the wild and wonderful beasts out there. And then I did a PhD. Again, I was at the Institute of Zoology. So I was in London and that's kind of like the research arm of London Zoo. Mm, okay. And during that time, so for my PhD, I basically studied the sex life of flies. 
Um, so it, it took a while to get to where I am. Um, it was a tiny brown fly, but it was a Brazilian fly. So I spent a year of my PhD in Brazil, um, again, out in rainforests out there and did a whole bunch of stuff. So I basically studied behavioral ecology. So I studied the behavior of animals. I tend to, unlike you, I, I tend to avoid humans because I think they're quite complicated <laughs> and they often don't read the same manuals or um, do the things I want them to do. Um, so I'm, I'm very much animal based where I can possibly be. Um, and then after that PhD, I took a few years off, did a bit of traveling and I did my first postdoc in Sweden, actually, oh. Uppsala University. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was over there again, sex life of flies, but I, I, I broadened, I broadened a bit and I went to the sex life of birds as well. So I did a bit of um, behavioral ecology, studying some of the amazing species that they have there on one of the islands. Um, and it was at that point that I went to a conference and I met someone from the University of Melbourne, which is where I'm currently at. And I said, look, I really fancy coming to Australia. Um, and he said, brilliant, you know, there's this fellowship you can apply for. So I rather like you came for one year on a, <laughs> what was called a research fellowship. It was basically a travel fellowship. Um, and I got here and I, A, I liked it and B, I met someone um, and I've been here for 20 years. So I studied initially behavior of animals. I did a whole bunch of different things. I worked on lots of different species we have here in Australia. But I realized that that was probably limited and funding options were really quite mm -hmm. limited as, as they are across the world. And so I wanted to do something a bit more applied. Um, and so it's really a, um, a story of serendipity. I met someone who was doing a, a research interview or a lectureship interview here in Melbourne. And he actually worked in humans and in IVF and he said they've noticed in IVF that many of the women that were coming in had oh, sorry many of the women that they had came in I'm just going to put my phone on to um, airplane mode as we go um had sleep issues so and they were kind of relating that to sleep issues meaning they got up looked at had lights on they were disrupted levels of melatonin and they were thinking that maybe this was um, problematic. And so they were thinking that artificial light at night was having some um, biological effect on maybe things related, factors related to sleep, and then that could potentially affect reproduction. So, mm. so melatonin, as I'm sure you know, melatonin is a chemical that we have in our bodies. It's often referred to as, you know, the chemical of darkness. Um, in humans, it peaks during the night, but it's sensitive to light. And when it peaks, we, we're more sleepy. I'm, I'm Coles to Newcastle at this point for you. Um, but and obviously under light, it's production declines. And so um, that can cause increases in activity and weakness. But the other thing that it does, that melatonin is a powerful antioxidant. So rather like your raspberries and the antioxidants you get in raspberries, melatonin serves a similar function uh, in humans anyway. But the interesting thing from my perspective is that melatonin is also an ancient hormone. And so I realized at that point that all of these things I was being told about humans, I could apply to other animals. And I thought, well, you know what, this is my applied link. Now I can take the sex life of flies and I can look at the sex life of flies with and without the lights on at night um, and actually start investigating the impact more broadly on other animals and also plants. And as it turns out, bacteria, a whole suite of species mm. have similar mechanisms and melatonin as one of those drivers. But that's kind of where I started. Um, so to, um, before we go any further, I just yeah. want to come back to, because there's lots there in that, uh, oh, in sorry. that overview. Sorry, you could have just stopped me at any time. <laughs> Stop. Um, so I just wonder, what, what was your fascination like to, to study this at the very start? Like, why did you want to go and like, you know, do zoology when you were younger? Did you have a fascination with like the outdoors and life or what got you into this? I love, I love forests. I love, I love being outside. It's my, it is my womb. Um, yeah. That is my safe space to be in a forest. And I've always been interested in animals. When I was, this is going to sound really sick, but when I was really little, we have um, in the UK, um, what we call crane flies here, daddy long legs, we call them in the UK, but yeah, yeah. long, yeah, so crane flies. And I remember when I was about six or seven saying to my mum, mum, what are they doing? Because there were two crane flies stuck together. And she sort of went, oh, you know, right, we're not going to talk about that. Um, and they were mating crane flies. And I realized at that point that was the only time you could actually catch them because they were so preoccupied in mating that I could catch them and hold them. And I just I had this fascination with just observing what they were doing. Um, and the other thing is I love travel. 
and I love being in new places where you get to see these incredible new species and just sitting and watching the behavior of other animals other than humans for me um I just found a fascinating thing and I love mm. trying to work out what they were doing and why they were doing what they, mm. what they were so you weren't like a, you know, like a Dave Attenborough fan or Jane Goodall. It wasn't some sort of experience like that that you just naturally no. kind of went to a. Yeah, I mean, I am a David Attenborough fan, and I very yeah, yeah. much, you know. Um, but no, it was it was just I don't know. There's a there's a serenity and a peacefulness about just watching watching nature do its thing, and plants are a little bit less um, charismatic. Animals were my thing. Mm. It's a very, uh, a very appealing, maybe career change for me. <laughs> you do get to go to some very nice places. <clears throat> <clears throat> yes, I get to go to yeah. nice places. Yeah, but it's mainly city based. Yeah, that's the yeah. Problem. No, I like. I'm. I'm yeah. I'm, an, I'm a nature and forest girl. Yeah. But it, but it's interesting you talk about that because like, um, I do feel like, and this is probably off topic here today, but I do feel like well, it, it is <laughs> like you said a minute ago. We might meander and come back. But I think that is that is somewhat of a problem that we have with sleep, which I, I want to touch on with which is there as well with animals, because obviously animals are in these habitats where they're in like forests or woodlands or you know, rainforests or on savannas, whatever it might be. And, and we as humans are in these urban environments. And from a human perspective, the more time we spend in these urban environments or the the more we're kind of concentrated in these cities, the less sleep we're having, the more metabolic issues we're having, the more um the more health issues we're having. We've even seen recently in the the Lancer report on the which was called the value of dying, just looking at death in society, that like life expectancy is actually going down. It's not going up, which is mm. quite quite fascinating. And that's that's in Western countries, not in like developing countries or third world countries. And so, you know, trying to work out cause and correlation is very difficult, obviously, with these things. But one of the things we are seeing is like rising obesity rates, rising anxiety, rising depression. But we also see as well in lots of studies that the more time people spend in connected with nature. Um, like Ian McGilchrist's work recently talks about, you know, things like being connected into nature and um, being connected, like from a religious or spirituality point of view, is very important, like for for mental health and longevity and and sort of overall health and well being. So I think there's some kind of maybe crossover with the animal world and and humans. Maybe we should be a bit more like them than than we think. Yeah, I mean, animals have lots of stresses. I mean, they obviously they're trying to survive and find food and resources so there, there are stress levels there but I think and I think that's my that's my fascination and my love of being in nature is that it's less complicated actually and it's less of an assault on your senses I find being in a city so I've just come back from um, overseas and we were in Vanuatu which is just the happiest people I've ever met and just just you know forests everywhere and it's like everything else just drops away and you can just be and mm. there's less of a um, you know an acoustic assault on your your ears and you know visual stuff coming and going everything moves quickly and i think yeah. that that level of stress i think is very much about an urban environment you know aside from any of the, the light and the other toxins but just that um frenetic um pattern of life that we have I, I mean, I think, you know, animals, plants, whatever, um, they experience some of those stresses, but there's a simplicity to mm. that, a simplicity and a dangerousness, right? Because you do have to, you do have to find your dinner, you do have to find somewhere to live, and you do have to try and reproduce successfully, otherwise you go extinct as a, as, well, as an, a family, but also potentially as a species. But I do think that, yeah, that, that, that simplicity of life is something that humans those certainly living in urban environments no longer have. Hmm. Yeah, as you're talking there, you just remind me about the first time I went to New York and I came out of a train station, went from Boston to New York on the train. I came out in New York and I thought I was going to have a panic attack. Yeah. Within five minutes, I was like, this is just way too much. I got to the hotel and I was like taking deep breaths. I was like, this is just... And it wasn't like, oh, wow, I'm in New York. I'm so excited. It was more like the pace of this is just not synchronizing with my body at the moment. This just does. This feels like I've been just catapulted into a different dimension. That's how I felt. I and it took me a good twenty-four hours to synchronize to it. Yeah. And whilst then I did have a good time for the time we were there, it would not be a place I would like to live in. That that sort of level of, it was like everything got ratcheted up like two hundred percent in me, and I was like, doesn't suit me. Like living here in Perth, it's like a big country town, and that's that's big enough for me. Yeah, 
you know yeah. i can't even i can't even go to sydney i get i get panic attacks nearly like it's just it's too much so when you're talking about that a lot has resonated with me personally as well which i'm sure lots of other people would have the same experience i i, I had exactly the same experience in new york i went for a conference a few years ago and it was look like <clears throat> It is an amazing city. Like it yeah. really, you know, it's, it's and, and I was saying, you know, it's what is it, the city that never sleeps, but it's mm. just a city that never shuts up. Right? Yeah, it's constant noise. Constant. Yeah. But yeah. there is something energizing about that for a short period of time. And I have to say though, my my place of peace was the Natural History Museum there. It's just <laughs> the most amazing building. Just like, okay, just leave me, I'm fine. But, um, yeah. but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm completely with you. I was, I, to be honest, so my partner is actually from Canberra. And I love, I'm possibly one of the few, but I really like Canberra. I love it. I think you can get out into the bush really easily. It's a, you know, a lovely city. And every time we come back to Melbourne, it's, it's full on for me. It's a few days just to get back into the Melbourne yeah. pace of life, which is a bit faster. I think, I think we'll disagree on the Canberra thing there. I know. <laughs> I, honestly, it's, uh, yeah, anyway, it's a good wineries as well. So. I did some studies there as part of my PhD with the Australian Institute of Sport. And I was like, uh, okay. No, not for me. <laughs> yeah. If you get blue tongue livers in your garden, it's great. So, yeah, actually, you probably do that in Perth. So, <clears throat> yeah. so Teresa, you did find Teresa, you did find find or the word uh, co chair in uh, co founder, I suppose, of the Australasian Dark Sky Alliance, which uh, I recently came across, and I found this was a fascinating website. A fascinating website, and has a podcast. I suppose would it be loosely associated or associated with it, dark skies yeah we have a number yeah. of different yeah webinars yeah. and podcasts yeah. yeah yeah can you tell us a little bit about what that what the goal of that organization is yeah so so ADSA um Australasian Dark Sky Alliance um was founded about three or four years ago now the the, the principal driver behind it was Marnie Ogg who's just incredible um so she was the um, original CEO and one of the founding directors there were nine of us initially we met at a conference which Marnie had organized. Um, and it became clear that there was, you know, we were mobilizing within Australia, um, a groups of people who had quite diverse backgrounds. So Marnie's very much from travel and tourism. Um, there were others there who were from the lighting industry. We had people from government um, and, and, the, and a few ecologists as well. So the idea behind the Dark Sky Alliance is really to increase awareness, um, to try and do things to promote um, dark sky awareness, promote from my perspective, trying to reduce lighting, not just from a human perspective, but actually extend it more broadly to mm -hmm. um, the other species, basically, that we share the planet with. Um, so we've done a number of events. We try and have information um, about things that are going on across Australia. And also we instigated um, ADSA approved, which is a, a lighting um, uh, approval system where companies can submit lights for different levels of um, uh, dark sky awareness or sensitivity, if you like. So, and one of the things I really like about it is one of them was wildlife sensitive. So really trying mm. to knock out some of those more dangerous colors of light because all light is not the same. And yeah. you know, blue light, as I'm sure you know, um, which many people that listen to you know, um, is potentially one of the more problematic um, in terms of the wavelength. So this wildlife sensitive lighting um, is, is largely amber, you know, 2700 Kelvin or below. Um, and so that really is hopefully less problematic. It has less of an impact on melatonin um, and is potentially better. So yeah, ADSA really is trying to promote awareness and, and be an advocate for dark skies and really trying to, um, educate those people who want to be educated but also trying to get the message more broadly so we um, speak at different conferences or, or different talks wherever people really want us to yeah and so you've done a, a number of research projects around this and collaborate with other people as well and one one that actually um sort of drew my attention because i'm dealing with it right at the moment um i call them the little brave bastards of the garden the willy wagtails they walk mm -hmm. around with their chest out and they fly up at you when you're watering the grass and come at you. They're in the tree, chirping all night, four and five o'clock in the morning, all the way through. And you're thinking, oh, my God, these things are driving me mad. And I came across your work on the wagtails that you had done with, with uh, another uh, another person as well. I can't remember her name off the top of my head. Um, Ashton, Ashton, Ashton Dickerson, Ashton, my PhD Ashton Dickerson, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yourself um, and, um, and Michelle Hall, was it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and right. names on it. And so I found this fascinating. So... 
can you can you give us a bit of an overview of what these whitetails are doing at night um, in terms of their their behavior? Because I because I, I want I want to try and understand my nemesis in the garden at the moment. Yeah, so your nemesis in the garden is a male woolly wagtail trying to get a mate. Basically. Ah. So um So I live in a nightclub for wagtails. You are basically, <laughs> yeah. And you should be very proud of yourself. Um yeah, so woolly wagtails are obviously they sing um and during the mating season, which might be a bit more protracted, so longer in Perth compared to um, maybe Melbourne, for example. Um during the mating season, males they've got their little white um, brows and um, they'll they'll try and sing on a song post so they stand on a song post and they sing their little hearts out and what we think they're doing they're, they're doing multiple things they're probably defending their territory against yeah. other male invaders they're defending their female potentially um, but they're also trying to attract females so what they're trying to do is increase their mating success kind of goes back to my original you know, mating system stuff that I used to do um, now what's interesting about it though is that they do that not the same every single night so the amount of song that they have isn't the same every night because of course mm -hmm. nighttime is not the same across a month we have a lunar variation in nighttime as well and so under natural conditions so if you've got a lovely dark area woolly wagtail males tend to sing more during very bright moonlight nights and what we think is happening is that increases their visibility as well because they're quite a visually attractive bird as well as being well, you don't think they're acoustically attractive, but to the females, <laughs> they're very acoustically attractive. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they're trying to increase the amount of time that they have to attract females um, potentially at those sites. But that's what they're doing. It is a little nightclub, a willy won't tell nightclub. All right. Um, and it, is this only happening in spring or does it happen all year round or is it what's the what's the time period so i know i, I might have to move out move out and do airbnb for a few weeks yeah it's it's not just, yeah it's quite a long time period um so it's their breeding season which here in in melbourne will be kind of september possibly all the way through to about march april you could really? possibly get singing it will peak during certain time periods it's going to peak just prior to females laying their eggs and baby wagtails being born because they're trying to increase the number of matings and females that they mate with um, so yeah, if you move out, you probably want to get a timeshare somewhere about six months of the year. <laughs> move back into the apartment and in the city. And move back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, is this is is um, what what's the impact then of artificial light at night? I think in lots of your work, you call it Alan A L A N, artificial light at night. What's the impact of this artificial light, like street light and or ambient light from houses, on this sort of process that these white tails are are doing? Yeah, so Ashton's um, PhD, she was really looking at the role of nocturnal song. So not all birds sing at night, actually. In fact, not mm. very many do, but more than we used to think. Um, what her research demonstrated is that when there was bright light, so when you had artificial light at night or alarm, um, that relationship with the moon was masked a little bit. It was dampened. So it looked as though even on those bright moonlit nights, the wagtails weren't singing as much. Now, oh, we don't definitively know why that is, but one of the things is it maybe made them a little bit too visible. So when you have a bright street light, you really do often end up with something that approximates daylight. Mm. Um, that's very visible, that's highly visible. That means that things like vis um, visual predators um, can also see you, you know, and the light is bright enough that their visual acuity will be such that maybe that increases your predation risk. So what was happening essentially was that light at night was masking some of the natural behavior that we um, that we see in these wagtails, which for you might be a good thing, right? Because there'd be less males singing. Um, mm. Obviously not great for the males because it means yeah. they're potentially messing up with their mating system. All right. And this is only from street lighting. So it's not from any ambient light from houses or Hopefully, cars yeah. or <laughs> something like that. The site where we did it actually only had street lights. So it tended to be um, less, we tended to go into areas where um, there were more forested areas or, or fields. So we didn't have houses interfering with that. Yeah. Basically any light that increases the visual, um, uh, the visual landscape is gonna potentially have an effect. Yeah. All right, so a very technical question on that then, Teresa, is how was that measured? How was that song measured? We used um, automated audio recorders. So we just have a little recorder that we can put up It's literally about three by two, three centimeters by two centimeters. And it just records the soundscape. So it records all of the sound um, over, in our case, it was a, you know, a week to two week period. And then we just took those recordings, which you can imagine are thousands of hours of recording. And we used a, um, a program, an automated program to extract 
the incidences of Willy Wagtail song. Oh. And so that sounds really cool. And I thought, yeah, it's really quick. It's relatively quick, but it turns out individual male wagtails have individual songs. And so we had to put individual templates in. So they actually had their own individual speech, if you like, or song. So we used an individual template matching for each one, but we were able to extract all the incidences of male wagtail singing to about 95% confidence. So you could differentiate between which male wagtail and you could, did you get them names or numbers? What did you do? And they were numbers. Numbers, oh, I didn't get the names. Did you have names yourself in the lab anyway? No, no. we tend not to. Actually, they no. do. A lot of other people do, though. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> tend to be numbers. Site numbers, numbers because then you can allocate it straight back to the site. Yeah. Okay. They're quite I, I, territorial, actually, as well. So, yeah. That, well, they're quite vicious, as you know, right? So they're... Um, quite yeah. brave. They're so brave. Yeah, they're cocky. I, I, was, I was here a few... a few Well, must have been probably in the last summer, and I was so, just a... Uh, spraying the yard like at the, the garden and he just kept coming at me at the hose and attacking the hose and me and i'm like yeah. this size you're so brave you little yeah. bastard get away his territory you're invading yeah <laughs> right. it's, like, it's my garden no, if you want it if you, <laughs> if you want it you want it you need to pay the mortgage my friend yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's probably taking a few nasty pests away if that makes you feel any better about him uh, squatting. does he but, yeah. what 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 sort of pests would he take away well i'll take some of the insect pests away maybe Okay. from your garden so it'll do actually they do they they will forage around street lamps as well nocturnal foraging so ashton observed them um foraging around street lamps because insects get attracted to the light yeah. and then the wagtails would come in and forage around those lights hmm. okay. very interesting now another another piece of work um you were involved in as well Teresa, was this one called artificial light at night promotes bottom-up changes in woodland food chain and this was beyond my pay grade, and I was looking at it, but the title kept catching me. I was like, oh, even though I've got no idea what's going on in this study, because outside of my field, I was like, nice big words in here, like tree morphology, uh, neck carving gain, photosynthesis, and all this sort of stuff. I thought, I'm just going to ask Teresa to, Teresa to explain this, because I've got no idea. What, this, this is like artificial night promotes bottom-up changes in woodland food chain. Yeah, so this was a project by another PhD student of mine, so he's also now, so Ashton is um, qualified, so she's now a doctor, um, she's in Germany actually, um, in the Max Planck Institute doing some work over there. Um, Ashton, um, this work that you're talking about is my, another one of my recently completed PhD students, Marty Lockett, and so what Marty did was, Ashton did it at the individual species level, what Marty did was actually looked at a food chain. So he looked at a food chain between eucalyptus trees, mm. so insects that feed on eucalyptus trees, and they're called psyllids. Now you would know them as probably the little white spots that you see on the leaves of eucalyptus trees. I don't know if you've ever seen oh, those. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, those, so those little white spots are actually um, sugary shell casing of this okay. insect, a juvenile form of this insect called a psyllid. And the, um, so the little insects will pierce the leaf and they feed on the leaf and they excrete or secrete this um, sugary case. So that's the second species. And then the third species that Marty worked on, which is not in this paper that you're um, referring to, but is a, a bell miner. So again, you might know this is one that makes a kind of tinging bell sound um, bird species. And they're interesting because they feed on the little sugary cases and they farm them. So they actually just take the case and they leave the little nymph, the little juvenile insect there, and then the juvenile makes another shell case and then the bell miner can come in and take it again. So they farm mm. them. So what Marty did was actually look to see whether light at night affected all of these different levels in that food chain. And whether, you know, like dominoes falling, you affect yeah, one yeah. in the food chain, whether it then affects. And what he found was no evidence at all that it affected the psyllids. They seem to be absolutely fine. Um, but what he did find is some changes to photosynthesis. So the tree's um, ability to produce, convert sunlight into energy. And so we find some differences at the levels of light that would be at artificial um, light at night. The trees were photosynthesizing during the night um, mm. and producing differences then in growth and productivity. So a bit like humans were looking at that light as if like it was a signal from the day nearly. Yeah, yes, exactly. Right. So um, yeah, yeah, the light that we have, because artificial light is the same as I mean, light is light. Yeah. Right? So artificial light tends to have peaks in the blue and some peaks in the yellow to red. And both of those are used by plants to photosynthesize. So those blue peaks are signals of daytime in particular. Um, so they can use that color from artificial light at night to enable photosynthesis to carry on. 
at a lower level, but it's still carrying on. Wow. So that's the bottom up. So the bottom up is going from the plants to the insects to the, um, the birds. And what he found was at that bottom level, we were affecting change with the presence of light at night. Wow. He'd explain it a lot better than I just did, by the way. But um, the I wanted to talk to him about that one. So I would have thought just straight away, I would have been like the top of the food chain because it would be more exposed. But it's interesting mm -hmm. as the bottom, like the opposite way around, you would think just from an exposure point of view. Yeah, so yeah, it's having massive. It. Well, you think about a tree though. So he actually, what he did was took a field in the middle of um, a dark area in outside of Melbourne, and he created little plots. So he had, you know, twelve by tw uh, two by twelve rows of trees, um, and basically grew eucalyptus leaves, and we had lights or no lights, and then we were able to measure productivity and everything about it all the way through. It was a very cool study. So Theresa, with some of this work like this, what, what's the practical application of like these types of studies? The practical application is that we can then take this information and we can say to councils, you know what, if you have lights, so one of the things that councils do, and I'm sure, per, in fact, I know they do, um, often lighting engineers or lighting people will put um, a light in a tree. They will actually put a light in a tree because it gives this beautiful graded light coming out and it's diffused light. And so they use mm -hmm. trees actually to help them. But what we now know is we can say to them, well, actually what you're doing is disrupting, you know, some of the plants. We know that trees under artificial lights at night tend to think it's spring or summer for longer. They don't shed their leaves. So deciduous trees will retain their leaves for longer because they haven't got that short daytime. So you would know that more from Europe. But um, as winter comes on, obviously during autumn, all the leaves are shed from the trees. What stimulates that is changes in light and its day length. So if you've got artificial light at night, your day length doesn't change. It's still quite bright. Mm. And so they don't do that. So we can we can talk to councils. We can talk to people, you know, um, environmental people and say, well, you're actually shifting some of the important things within your environment. You are changing the bottom of these communities um, and that's potentially affecting a, a whole suite of different things. So even though in the psyllids we didn't get changes, you know, those trees would support other species, they would support spiders. We know that in spiders, light dramatically influences growth and development. Um, and so it means that we have demonstrable evidence suggesting that light is bad and that we need to be thinking about, can we reduce the level of lighting? Can we reduce how long that light's on there for? Can we take it away? Can we definitely not deploy it if we don't have to? It, it allows us to actually instigate those conversations because Often, and you will know this from human literature, you need really good evidence before people will do anything. Um, and you need really, really good evidence in um, when you're talking to councils about lighting because risk and security are at the forefront of their minds. So you have to really try and persuade them that actually it is having an ecological impact. So the work that we're doing is really contributing to that. So I have a confession, Teresa. In my garden at the front, I have beautiful white fairy lights around the tree. Should mm -hmm. I remove those fairy lights? <laughs> Turn them off as soon as you can at night. Um, yeah, I mean, Christmas is a nightmare, right? Um, beautiful and torn. It's, it kind of is beautiful. Humans love light. We do. Mm. Um, it looks beautiful. But there is absolutely no question that those fairy lights will actually give off enough light, but you're potentially disrupting the migratory pathways of insects in your garden. You're changing where animals will reside or not. You're illuminating bits of your garden and making them less habitable for some species. Um, on the plus side, the yin and the yang of biology is that because you're making them attractive to some insects, anything that eats an insect has a really easy dinner. Um, you know, so there are yeah, pluses yeah. or minuses, but that plus means that you're disrupting the natural balance. Um, Them lights are coming down tonight. <laughs> if you leave your, honestly, if you leave your curtains open, you're possibly doing stuff like that too. Anything where light is outside in the environment where it's not supposed to be is potentially disruptive to ecological communities. The long term effects on that, we're still, you know, trying to work those out. But, you know, you will see yourself on well, my kitchen window doesn't have a blind, I confess too, right? Um, and as I do washing up late at night, I can see insects on my, on my window. Now, I like that because I try and sex all the little moths and the beetles. Um, it's not <laughs> great. Right, there you go, everybody. That's your first action on this podcast today. Take down any fairy lights in the garden or at Christmas time or Halloween. Be careful where you put them up. And if you are going to have them up and you want to have them up, turn them off as soon as possible. So yeah. 
you have them on for the first few hours of night maybe and turn them off before you go to bed yeah god my yeah i've got a set that in the summer is on all night solar ones are bunnings just going all night so those solar ones are quite weak after a while um, yeah. they're not too bad the security lights are probably worse in all fairness yeah um, so if you've got a security light really do i would have that on a sensor so it's only really on there when you need it rather than just being on all night yeah yeah um, yeah because they're really bright and they're quite disruptive um yeah we don't what's interesting is we don't actually know why insects are attracted or um you know a moth to a flame really we think it's because they're potentially they think it's the moon or they're naturally attracted to or maybe it's a space thing it's no longer darkness and weirdly, but regardless we know that it does have an effect yeah but it's it's interesting isn't it because even like humans even outside of the world say the sleep the sleep world <laughs> is that humans at night time will will gather together and gather towards light as well light. yeah yeah no, it's absolutely security for us i mean we're a visual species we're not yeah. our other senses are really rubbish yeah. Um, yeah, on the our vision's not that great, but yeah. It's it's you know what's really interesting. Like I um as many people know I listen to this, I started my career out in the military and then for years after that, I did lots of like ultra distance running. So like running 100, 100 kilometers or 170 kilometers, and obviously you run through the night. So during the day you run along and you're covering ground, you just kind of say hello to someone, you chat for a few minutes, whatever it is. The minute night happens, everybody bunches into packs of like two to four people. And even if you're on, if you get separate and you're on your own, if you see somebody running because you've got lights on, you just want to go to that light. Yeah. And it's really interesting, even though, you know, the course is completely safe, you know, there's marshals every like few kilometers, wherever it is, or plenty of, but when night falls, you just really want to gather up and bunch up together and be around that light. It's really fascinating to watch and you just can't help yourself, but you want to be around it or you see lights in the distance and it kind of makes you run faster to that area. It's really yeah. interesting, like this kind of affinity we have to light at night. Yeah, I mean, like it's a safety thing. It is a safety thing, and it's you yeah. know because it is our vision is the way that we can make sense of the world. Um, we're not if we are in darkness, like it's really difficult to you know we don't have particularly good sound abilities mm. to you know hear sound and our you know our smell is atrocious. Mm. Um, even compared to other primates, we're you know we're poor. We're absolutely rubbish compared to a dog or a cat. Um, so that's what we have. Vision is our world. It is our yeah. world. That's how we make sense of it. Do you go faster? at night because i always um, think i go faster at night so if i'm running i often run away i don't, well, I don't run two miles would be enough but yeah there's no, no speed difference not not for those because it was all like ultra mount it was all like uh, oh, ultra yeah. racing ultra racing in, in mountainous areas so it was all off road so it would depend on the terrain okay. so you know you're up and down mountains and you're carrying a pack as well so and generally you're by by nightfall on some of the races you're like you know 70 80 k's in so you just don't have the ability to go faster really you're kind of just shuffling at that stage um, why? Why does one do this? Well, it's interesting because I was speaking about this last week about on another podcast I have called Learning to Die, which is a kind of a philosophy history podcast. I interviewed somebody from the UK who works with Channel 4 and BBC and so on. And, and um, her name is Miriam Francois. And she was a she's a French Irish lady who grew up in England and she converted to Islam in her early 20s. And we were talking about, you know, the Islamic faith and we were talking about different practices and we we're talking about you know, like in Christianity or Catholicism, it's like self-flagellation with people like whipping themselves or kneeling on barbed wire and stuff like that. And you know, a lot of people look at that and go, oh, why, why do you do it? And so people do it for spiritual practices to gain like a new level or a new, you know, awakening or insight. I think to a certain degree, a lot of people are doing that in society as well by running ultra marathons, marathons, swimming, doing Ironmans. They're, they're going through that physical, you know, <laughs> what, what did I go? Proxy self, what did I call it last mm-hmm. week? I can't remember. Like self-imposed self-flagellation mm-hmm. because... To, to get to that realization or to break through and see what they're capable of doing and they want to try and understand themselves more or, or gain some benefit from it so anyway that's that's definitely a side note from what we're talking about <laughs> no, 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 I, I find that fascinating yeah I mean, it's yeah. Like, yeah i mean I, i'm assuming yeah. you achieve some sort of zen as you're doing it it's the only way you can get around isn't it definitely get into flow states like um yeah. and i've i've done polar ops once where i've gone on um um meditation retreats that were silent and you couldn't do it you wouldn't do exercise so you go from one extreme to the other and it's really interesting because i think in those in those experiences i've done long distance ocean swimming as well like out to 20ks and i think in those experiences you get to like a flow state and a zen state if you want to call it that but also as well you understand a lot about who you are 
you understand your weaknesses, you start questioning like what you're doing with your life to a certain degree, what you value, what you don't value. You start analyzing your own behaviors. It's like a self-imposed therapy session as well. So you always come out of one of those things, those events, learning a lot about yourself. And then when you do encounter, I find um, from doing martial arts, long distance running or long distance swimming or pushing myself academically, when I do then come across a challenge, I go, well, I've pushed myself in all these different domains. What I'm facing today isn't such a big challenge, really, because I've, 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 you know, I've done this physically, I've done this mentally, I've done this spiritually, whatever it might be. And it's not that I'm trying to tick boxes, but it's just pushing myself in different ways to understand myself. And then when you do get a problem, it's not insurmountable. You're kind of like, mm, you know, it's, we'll apply kind of the same logic to this problem. We'll try and break it down. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I could be just a, the weird outlier. I don't know. But that's no, how I, I feel about it. Yeah. I think it's addictive as well, though, isn't it? It's that um, there's got to be an endorphin kick in there as well. And it's, um, I, I did martial arts for a while. And, you know, even that's just, there's something about it. That's, but the Zen, I, I would never do long distance running. I can run about 10K and that's it for me. And even then, even then the dog looks at me and goes, what can I do? <laughs> right? um, but swimming is the thing where I can get that Zen. I can process swimming. I like it. It's, swim, yeah. swim, swimming's good in terms of the breath like because you have to you have to control your breathing when you're yeah. swimming like you can panic breath in, in you can pa panic breathe in running and get away with it even in martial arts to a certain degree you can get away with it for a little while you can't panic breathe in the water you'll drown yeah, no, that's a good point. <laughs> it's really bizarre like no matter what happens and yeah whatever that's it yeah it is it's yeah. A, that's it, yeah you have to you have to get into that cadence you know and yeah. Even when like dolphins swim on top of your seals and you're shitting yourself, you have to <sighs> control this breath. Yeah, I, to be fair, I can't. I can't even see kayak. I'm absolutely terrified of water. The only time I can be in water is if I'm snorkeling or diving, because then uh, the, the stuff around me, I can. Um, yeah, it takes me away from the fact that I might die. Yeah. <laughs> and again, safety in numbers. People who, because um, we did some research in uh, the swimming behaviors of ultra ocean swimmers uh, last year. And what's interesting is then looking at some of the other literature as well, that people who do a lot of ocean swimming, uh, particularly in the morning, obviously lower stress, you know, better happiness and all these better outcomes. And that's, it's probably attributed to early morning sunlight, routine, social interaction and so on, cold water exposure, all of these things, really hard to parse out which one is actually impacting them. But what's really interesting is that people felt that when they swam in groups, that it was, that they didn't feel like the ocean was was uh was dangerous but when they swam in like maybe one or two one or two people went they were like shitting themselves but when it was 20 it was like got absolutely no fear so it's again comes back to that thing about at night time like with the run and people gathering in groups together yeah. well you've only got to like, run the slowest person in the group haven't you yeah, yeah. <laughs> st 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 stay, st stay mid pack yeah. Yeah. i was like once you've got someone behind me and someone in front of me, my chances are less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, for sure. Very sensible. <laughs> uh, Teresa, you did some stuff here as well. Um, you spoke there obviously about melatonin at the start, but you did it like a, obviously the big big review on artificial light and night at sleep. And you also looked at white and amber light at night disrupt sleep physiology in birds. Yeah. Um, so what 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 impact is it having on the on the sleep physiology of, of these birds with this artificial light? Yeah, so, so that was a, a lab-based study. We've done a field-based and a lab-based study on this. Um, what he was doing was changing the depth and the intensity of sleep. So the intensity of sleep and actually the duration of sleep. So it's affecting not only the quantity, but also the quality of sleep. It was making them more alert. The birds are funny little things. They tend to have very um, uh, short periods. of They'll have micro sleeps, basically, but they, mm. they would be awake more um, during periods where there were white lights and amber lights for pigeons. So amber lights actually made no difference at all. So I talked earlier about that wildlife yeah, sensitive yeah. lighting and, you know, amber is not the, you know, the, um, the cure all. It's going to be very species specific. And what we found is in the pigeons, amber light made no difference at all. It was sort of like, yeah, yeah, I'm awake. Um, magpies, on the other hand, when we put amber, actually went back much more rapidly to sleeping normally. So amber light seemed to aid magpies in terms of their um, their sleep compared to white light. So it did have an effect in that species. We don't really know why. We know that sensitivities to light differ and sensitivities to particular colors of light differ across species. So we're never going to have one light that's you know perfectly safe for all wildlife, but there's going to be degrees, right? Um, so did so I that, hear, did, sorry, did I hear that right, that amber light made magpies sleep more 
Well, they kind of went back to a more normal sleeping pattern. So what we did when we say amber light, actually what we did was knocked out the blue. We used theatre filters. So the way that we did oh, it was yeah. we had LED lights, um, which replicated, well, actually, there were real street lights in effect. Um, and then what we did with the amber is that we actually just put an amber filter. So we had a big amber peak, no blue, no, nothing else. Um, and we used that and we monitored sleep under those conditions as well. Now for pigeons, meh, nothing. Um, magpies, it did seem to make a difference. Um, yeah. How did you measure sleep in birds? And what I'm really interested in is the non-REM versus REM. How was that measured in birds? It's actually with a, a, um, in, the, in the brain. So we had probes in the brain. She did it. It's actually properly measuring sleep waves. Um, so sensors really? were on them. Yeah. So like a polysonography for a bird where you're looking yeah. at EEG of the brain. Mm -hmm. yeah. how, how in the name of God do you get that onto them and keep them still? And how, how does that work? I didn't. Um, we had a collaborator who um, <coughs> did that. So you, you put it in um, and then they, they sort of glue it on and you can, and it's a plug and then you remove it at the end and it actually grows over. It's amazing. Oh, so you, you actually can... insert it in, into the head. It's not actually like a patch with a human. No, do it yeah, actually goes inside it, but you can remove it. That was so you, a colleague who does sleep research in animals that did that. That was not my, I, I, okay. I, the, um, I do the behavior. So we measured, the other thing that we did actually with that study is we measured behavior. So we watched the animals as well. Um, mm. And the reason that we did that is obviously it's quite intrusive to do some of these sleep things. So what we wanted to do was say, well, can we correlate the behaviors that we see with patterns of sleep? So we did that in some swans, in the black swan. And what we found is that we actually could. And that's really good now because that means we don't have to do intrusive stuff anymore. Yeah, you can yeah. actually look at patterns of behavior and say, this is, it might not be perfect. But it's a proxy measure for a sleep. really good yeah. proxy measure for sleep. Um, so we use that to try and minimize any um, invasive behavior later too. Who was the who was the um, who was the bird sort of uh, sleep physiologist? Who who did that? So, I'd be keen to talk to that person. He's great, actually. You should definitely interview him. Um, Associate Professor John Lesky from La Trobe oh, University. He, he just ate, I, I I yeah I've been yeah I'll talk to you about that offline. I'll, yeah, I I had an email from about four minutes before we started this podcast. Yeah, because he did some some stuff with a gentleman you might know from UWA where who was in the same um, school as me of anatomy, physiology, human biology. A guy called Shane Maloney. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't okay. know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so he he is definitely the person to talk to, and he would be hilarious to have a, uh, an interview. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've been having some conversations with him. That, that's yeah. um, fascinating. That he's great. He's a fantastic um, sleep researcher, actually. So, Teresa, if we look at the, this work that uh, you and your team have been doing, um, what would be the sort of takeaways you would say to people who are sitting at home, you know, on the couch, maybe listening to this and thinking about what they could do at home to uh, to help the wildlife in, in their own sort of uh, house ecosystem? What, what could they do in the next uh, day or two to maybe improve this? Yeah, I mean, I think we've talked about a few of them, right? I mean, really try and avoid letting any of the light that you need in your house for your own activities and feelings of safety and, and whatever it might be. Try and avoid that going out into the street. Yeah, try and avoid it going beyond the boundary of your house. So curtains where possible or blinds. If you have security lights, do they need to be on all night? Can you have them on a sensor or timed system? So they're not there. So we actually provide the rest of the species we share our planet or your street with, that the darkness that they require, not just those that are active at night, but those that are trying to sleep, right? Mm. Um, so birds are trying to sleep in the trees outside, but your fairy lights may be disturbing the odd. Actually, do you know what? The wagtails may be singing because of your fairy lights, by the way, Ian. You're actually making your garden brighter. Really? So, Maybe. They're coming down right now. Coming. <laughs> right now, they're coming down. They hear, he's out there and he's right there in the garden. <laughs> oh, in the daytime. It, 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 Bouncing it, it, around. <laughs> so I think, I think just really minimize any light spill. And by that, it's keep light where you need it to be and not beyond. And for no longer than you need it to be. And the other thing is, if you can, if you can use warmer colors of light rather than, you know, so there's warm white and cool white. If you can use warmer whites, for all the reasons that we use it for mm. you know trying to get to sleep is exactly the same for the other species um, the less blue typically the better um so and that means the less white the better so if you can use warm whites and not those white or blue um, led lights and that's better i would also encourage anyone i'm sure you've already said this to make sure that their own computers and everything like that also blue shifts at night or goes into the red um, mm. primary 
whole bunch of reasons. Fascinating. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, Teresa, thank you very much for coming on today. If people yeah. want to follow your work, they want to fund you for a trip to uh, Brazil, Hawaii, or any of these tropical islands, how can they get in touch with you? Um, you can get in touch with me at the University of Melbourne, just on my email, Teresa, T-H-E-R-E-S-A, at unimel.edu.au, or they can just look up the Urban Light Lab. Urban Light Lab. Urban Light Lab, yeah, which is excellent. And is Urban Light Lab, the, are you uh, active on like Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, any of those things? Mm, it is on Twitter, not yeah. on Instagram. Oh, I'm also on LinkedIn, actually. Yeah, On LinkedIn as well. Yeah. Very so good. I, feel free. I won't be in contact for the next 10 days because I am going to Hawaii and we're going to be looking at light pollution over there. So it's very exciting. So. Terrible. Now, um, uh, you've all heard of how hard it is in academia. So I want you all to take a moment and pause and reflect how unfortunate Theresa, Theresa is to have, has to go away on this terrible field trip for 10 days. <laughs> no comment. Not fair. <laughs> Theresa, thank you very much for your time. No worries. Cheers. Thank you.